Hello, I'm Michael Stack, and welcome to In Process, the show about the creative process. Today, we're talking with David Holt. David is the editor of Optimize and Silver Magazine out of Halifax, former editor of Progress Magazine, and um, one of my big thinker friends, and especially in the area of creativity, innovation, and strategy. Today, we're going to be talking to David about... um, the bigger picture of the creative process, how it's worked through history, what it means, how can we tell we're in a creative process, and what is the creative process? How does it work? So uh, settle in, get your creative brain going, and uh, let's get on with the show. And we are in process with David Holt. David, welcome to the show. Hi, Mike. Glad to be here. I'm glad you could make it. So uh, today we're talking about the creative process. And if I was to ask you, could you encapsulate the creative process in one word? What would it be? Sure can. The word is messy. Okay. And that's been verified by science. Okay. Can you expand on what you mean by that? Sure. Uh, Well, this psychologist, Barry Kaufman, who's been uh, studying creative people through the centuries, actually, and he has a wonderful book. He's a co-author called Wired to Create, and it's full of all kinds of analysis of different types of creative people and different types of processes, et cetera, et cetera. However, if you go right to the prologue at the beginning, he says, there's only really one common element of these geniuses through history in all these different fields, and it's that their creative process is messy. In fact, their lives are messy, their intellectual lives, their emotional lives, usually their workspaces, um, they're just like messy people. And yet somehow as the, you know, the days and weeks and years go by, uh, out of this messiness comes all kinds of cool stuff. But it's not just a little, you know, simple three-step process or 10-step process that you can read on some listicle. Everybody has to kind of find out their own process. And of course, you know, organization and stuff is part of it but no matter how much you try to uh kind of contain it and manage it messiness is part of the creative process do we know why it's messy well here's my answer that if things are all running smoothly you know you don't have to change anything and and here i think is a real essential conflict in the modern world we're always talking about productivity and how to be more productive and all that stuff so an insight i had a lot of a long time ago is productivity is really when you kind of know where you're going and what you're doing. And you're just fine tuning and you're fine tuning and you're fine tuning. And you're taking something that already works and it's working better. And that's not creativity. Creativity is starting out with something that you know may or may not work. And most people don't like to do that. They wanna be in a process. And so we're talking about the creative process. It's a bit of a paradox here. But if you really, really know what you're doing, you're not doing creative work, you're just fine tuning something that already works and that's called productivity. So that's why if you look at all these geniuses through history, a lot of stuff that they tried really didn't work. And some of the things that they tried they weren't really expecting to work did, or they got some insight from left field that they didn't expect and it reminded them of a, something from two years ago and they blend it all together and, uh, and off it goes. So is it safe to say that sometimes when we're in a creative process, we may not recognize that we have a process or that we're in one? Um, Yes. Uh, Here's an interesting thing is that um, people, um, I'm going to have to answer that one again, Mike, because there's a little grandson upstairs. Can you hear that? Can you hear him rolling his trucks around? No, that's, we're fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We 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 can put up with a little Tonka trunk traffic. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to, but because I can hear it a lot, I'm just gonna have to tell okay. them to tone it down a bit. Just okay. A sec. <laughs> I can, I can blend that into the story here. <laughs> no, it's perfect. Right. Yeah, so um, um, I think it's I think it's a good place for us to go from actually because um, I mean this may not show up in the cut, but what we just had to do was uh, we kind of had to stop the recording to to deal with a little distraction. Let's talk about distraction in the creative process. Right, absolutely, which is important. And here's an interesting thing about meditation because meditation there's different kinds, but the kind you usually hear about is the one pointed meditation for focusing 
which is for not being distracted. But actually, being distracted and mind wandering is a real important part of the creative process. The sort of the daydreaming thing that we, it's a natural part of our mental activity. And kids are really great at sort of flipping from, you know, daydreaming, I want to try something, and then actually going out and trying it. So right now, my grandson, who's a little engineer, heading for three years old, is upstairs. And uh, I had to ask him to stop driving his Tonka trucks right over my head. <laughs> but he's, he's super creative, and he's a little engineer, and he's always trying to figure out how something works and how something doesn't work. And he also allows himself to get distracted and go from one project to another project. And maybe 10 minutes later, he'll come back to the first one. And if you look at these creative geniuses like uh, Leonardo da Vinci and Einstein and Claude Shannon, I mean, they were doing, you know, switching back and forth on different time scales, but not just this sort of obsessive focus. I mean, yeah, you could have it sometimes, but that's kind of more about let's fine tune the assembly line and become more productive. That's part of the creative process, but part of it is allowing yourself to be distracted. And in fact, you know, the famous stories about the importance of going for a walk and having a shower and having a nap and all that kind of stuff. It's like, you know, your brain does overload and you focus on things and with the prefrontal cortex and all that. But but that's only part of the creative process. And the other part is information coming from different places and different directions in an unpredictable way, i.e. being distracted. Mm, which is actually like it's dropped into our process here today. Well, exactly. We have, we, have, we have a little guy upstairs playing with Tonka trucks, and now we're actually talking about that in our process. Right. I find that really yeah. interesting. Right. And, and, and see, one thing is all children are like this. Like all children are like this. It's so interesting. And the educational system, <coughs> excuse me, often, you know, you're supposed to sit still for an hour in front of the teacher and come up with the right answer. And your body's not supposed to move. And the body moving and breathing changes and, you know, your energy kind of flowing in your body is a huge part of the creative process. So this like sitting still and getting the right answer for teacher is not at all creative. In fact, I recently read this great book called Range, which is sort of about this subject. And the essence of it is that if you look at creative people in all these different fields, they have a lot of range and they have their one specialty, but they depart from their one specialty. And often these ideas come from reasoning by analogy. And so um, I hear the I hear the trucks upstairs. That's fine. <laughs> Oscar, Oscar's up there reasoning by analogy. But there's He's having fun and being creative in his process. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And all children do. And there's a famous quote by uh, Picasso to the effect that, you know, all children are artists. And the only difference for me is that I grew up, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't forget that I was an artist. Hmm. So like for our creative process, it's, um, it's a good thing to hang on to some of those childlike qualities. Well, exactly. And, and part of my kind of insights is that I've known a lot of talented creative people since I was a little kid in my own family and friends and schools and you know whatever a lot of creative people and and one of my early insights was that the creative process and the creative personality is essentially the same because you can be a brilliant mathematician but not a creative mathematician or you can be a brilliant fine artist but not a particularly creative fine artist so this analogy that i use is there's a cocktail party and there's a bunch of people from all over different fields and different experiences and after a while, there's these three or four quirky characters in a corner. They've somehow all found themselves. And they're, you know, one's an entrepreneur, and maybe one's a sports coach, and one's some technical guy, and one's something else. But they're these quirky creative people, and they found each other later in this cocktail party. So it's not so much that some fields are creative and some aren't. I think that's complete nonsense, actually. There's just these strange creative personalities. And they, they talk the same language, whether that's an artist or even like an analogy that I like to use is plumbing. Plumbing is really difficult. So you have some old house and it needs to be kind of replumbed. And somebody says, oh, you better call, you know, Joe from Ace Plumbing because this is his kind of thing. So he's one of these, you know, high level, spatial, brilliant, creative guys. He just happens to be a plumber. And just because you're like moving social media buttons around on a screen, I really don't like the term creative doesn't mean that you're creative. It's really not about the field. It's about the kind of the personality type. And, um, you know, I've known a, lot, I've known a lot of these people and, and you know, they're so interesting and they don't really know how they do it. Another, of course, we want to talk about process, but another interesting thing is just that um, 
I don't know, it's like it's a trial and error part, you know, because if you're always trying to be right, you're not going to do a trial, which might be an error. And that's where this book range is really good about how the educational system sort of beats the creative creativity out of people because you're supposed to be like on the fast track and get the fast, fast answer and give the teacher. And in fact, the teachers unconsciously promote this because it's supposed to be everything learning is supposed to be fast and easy. And, you know, if you're finding it fast and easy, then you're like smart and all that. Well, this range book actually says the complete opposite. It's the people who struggle early kind of ask the deeper questions. And then they'll, because they're asking the deeper questions, it automatically will slow you down. So it's good to be slowed down early and you kind of investigate things at a deeper level. So sometime later, when you're kind of up to speed, you really look at your field in a very different way from some guy that's kind of an ace. And uh -huh. example I'll use is like somebody that gets a physics textbook and they'll read it and they'll be really good at doing the questions at the end of the chapter and the teacher's real happy and this guy's real happy but they're probably not going to go on to change the field very much they can sort of master things easily at a super superficial level and they keep doing that for their entire lives and that's not very creative so this book range is really good about the importance of struggling early and i think one thing now in our internet age where you know we're used to things being fast and easy and you press the buttons you look at the pretty pictures and all that stuff a lot of this is really kind of the opposite of creativity it's it's like this illusion that you're really doing some cool stuff but because it's so quick and so easy it's not really that creative so it's so it's about asking why is that fair to say yes and in fact i got a big stack of books and one of the books that i didn't bring it's called The Power of Why by Amanda Lang, former CBC journalist. And it's all about this kind of stuff. These quirky guys that just sort of slam on the brakes and ask why all the time. And, and part of it is, you know, if you're always in a rush and you're always like really productive and smooth and quick, you know, you don't have time to ask why because that slows everything down. Mm -hmm. So I guess one of the things we're kind of touching on or edging towards is the idea of failing forward. Because you can get mired in your creative process because you're trying to make this thing. It's so great. But is there there's some value in just going out there? Yeah, for sure. I mean, this is kind of the essence of it. Um, and you can fail all the time and, you know, get frustrated and not do anything, you know, get depressed and stop, stop what you're doing. But if you look at these people through history, they had a lot of things that didn't work out very well. It's fascinating. And in fact, in this book, um, by the psychologist Kaufman, he analyzes, or people have analyzed like Beethoven, for example, and Shakespeare and Mozart, and these people with huge outputs, outputs over a long period of time. And what's really interesting is that some of their best work has been followed by some of their worst work, and some of their worst work has been followed by some of their best work. So having output is really important. And, um, and something else that's really interesting is that, like the idea of a block, when people say that they're blocked and they can't move on. And somebody I have to mention in this, uh, this interview is Robert Fritz. I took a week long seminar with him quite a few years ago and he's a musician and he has a wonderful theory of creativity, which is very, uh, very kind of simple. But uh, one of his stories is that a photographer came to him and she was this very accomplished professional photographer with a career and skill and all that sort of stuff and she was just kind of stalled out and she said she had you know creative block with her photography with her creative work and robert said well maybe you do but maybe you're just bored because you've been doing the same thing for a long time you're really good at it maybe you're just bored so he said why don't you go out and take some bad pictures and you know twirl the camera around and put it on the wrong settings and do stuff that's blurry and out of focus and whatever and just you know kind of try that for a while and see what happens and he said, after a while, the woman came back and she said, you were absolutely right. I was really good at my one style and my one this and my one that. And, and I'd lost the sort of joy of earlier in my career of experimenting, which is how I got to be good. And now I'm all charged up again. So anyway, I just, I love that story that sometimes, you know, you just get to be good at something. You've been doing it a long time. You're just freaking bored. And that's why when you look at the lives of creative people, they often, they go through phases. You know they're in a phase and then they, it kind of matures and they move on whereas most people they're thrilled because of the reinforcement that you're supposed to be good and successful they're thrilled and they just kind of stay there but they get stale and they get bored and they get boring and that's why you know i think this idea of shaking it up and screwing up is uh is fast you know is fascinating it's part of the process 
and and something else that I'm just sort of thinking about. Well, this book range talks a lot about the power of analogy, like thinking by analogy. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm actually reading this other book about Darwin and the theory of evolution, which kind of touches on this. But in a lot of these brilliant um, scientific theories, which is supposed to be a blend of induction and deduction and all this sort of stuff, but people don't appreciate the power of analogy and how it's used. So in the book Range, he talks about Kepler, who had to figure out the planetary motions. And the sort of early calculations, the rough calculations were pretty good, but the more they did the fine calculations, they found these anomalies in what were supposed to be circular orbits of the planets. Because Aristotle and the Greeks said, you know, the crystalline spheres and all this stuff, it was supposed to be these perfect spheres and perfect circles, but they weren't. So he worked for years and years trying to figure out how it actually worked. And it turned out the answer was that these orbits were actually like an ellipse, not a circle. And maybe there wasn't that much of a difference, but it took him years and years to work out the math. And at every step, he basically used an analogy from somewhere else. And he went through like seven steps and seven analogies and finally figured it out, which was, you know, against classical thinking and against Aristotle and, you know, against the church and all this other sort of stuff. But it was this long series of just trying these analogies and finally kind of getting the right one. Um, and, you know, you'll see that all over this, the scientific world, including Darwin. Uh, sort of putting things together by analogy and it's kind of it's clumsy and the trick is you know you can just give up and you might be two steps away from figuring it out but you give up and so it's this sort of mix in creativity with persistence you know trial and error and having your system and all that sort of stuff but but also being persistent and having kind of an instinct that you're on the right road even though you're not sure and maybe in fact you are not but how you know years and years and in fact there's a wonderful quote from isaac newton who did, you know, really founded modern science and um, something simple to the effect of the difference between me and other men is that I will just stay with the same problem for years. Okay, so sometimes it's good to get some distance, to get some altitude, or even maybe get out of your lane and look at some outside influences that have nothing to do with your process ostensibly? Is that? Well, absolutely, absolutely. That's what the book range is all about. Like these people, they have one specialty, but then you know, the modern term, it's like, yeah, they get out of their lane all the time. And if you look at these high level people, that's what you find. Whereas most people master the specialty, especially now it's harder and harder because it's so difficult to master, you know, some little segment of physical chemistry, for example, or whatever you're talking about. You spend years and years and you get better and better. And there's massive pressure to just stay there. But these quirky characters are always, it's just their nature or their training or whatever. They get out of their lane a lot. So they don't lose their specialty, but they can bring other things into it, often by analogy from from something completely unrelated. Oh, so it's a good way to get unstuck. Right. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And the, the tricky part is, you know, how much can you learn this stuff versus how much is just innate? And obviously you can learn it up to a point because some of these labs like the there was a some, some examples of these laboratories run by these quirky characters that encourage everybody to, you know, get out of your lane, explore the world and all that stuff. So and and just bring, you know, bring this new stuff into the uh, into the into the workshop. And there's all kinds of examples, actually, when if there's a team of scientists that are just the narrow specialists, they they don't really go too far. But if you encourage these same types of scientists to go outside and bring other things in. It's these analogies from outside that lead to the breakthroughs. Ah, right. So it's, it's coming at it from a fresh angle or a fresh perspective. Because you can get stuck, right. right? You can get a tunnel right. vision trying to look at the problem. And it seems like you dig yourself in deeper why, sometimes. Right. So that's the quibble that I have with this word productivity. It's all about this obsessive focus to make something better, quote unquote. Well, what the heck is better? You know, it already works okay. If you want to be more productive, you want to make it work better. But it means you're just staying in your little tunnel, you're staying in your little lane, and you know, the big insights come from combining combining things. Right on. Yeah. So and seeing what comes out of the machine at the end. <laughs> so it's a lot of trial and right. error. Right, absolutely. Yes. I mean that's kind of the you know, messy and trial and error. Boy, that's not what people want to hear when they want to go down the smooth path, the smooth career path and get all the rewards and, and all that sort of stuff. And in fact, we're, we're so social, we're programmed to really care about what people think about us. And that's a trap. And that's why in history, if you look at a lot of these people, 
they were quirky and part of it was they weren't obsessed with what everybody thought and i think like that's for example where some of these autistic people have an advantage like they can't read the social cues so well so if they're lucky they're able to kind of go off and you know work on their own and ask their own tough questions and, and analyze stuff by themselves without waiting for somebody to smile and nod at them you know to encourage their uh, their their latest insight like they don't really care because they're not reading the signals anyway so is ego an enemy of creativity um yes and no the irony is that you okay here's here's my thought on that um talent whatever that means there's a huge connection between talent and objectivity in any field like if you're a talented mathematician or a talented artist or whatever the heck it is you have high standards for figuring out if something's working or it's not working because that's what your talent does for you so i know some people that have a big ego and they don't quite have enough talent to keep it in line so they basically don't go anywhere and they're brilliant and wonderful but they don't really you know go anywhere because their ego keeps sabotaging them whereas other people can have a larger ego a greater sense of self and self-importance and be obnoxious or whatever but as long as your talent is greater it forces you to be object objective so therefore you have to admit that you're wrong and maybe yesterday you were sure that you were right but you just learned something now it's like damn i was wrong my talent forces me to acknowledge that so it's kind of a ratio thing you know as long as your talent is bigger than your ego it doesn't really matter how big your ego is you need an ego to have self-confidence and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. but if you've got a big ego and your talent's just a little bit below it it's, it's like you're going to self-sabotage yourself and you know you can just see that every day it seems like the difference between going forward and exploring and not is that fair to say that yes gap. right yeah and and just you know it's it's a it's the strangest thing like steve jobs is you know everybody talks about steve jobs who was a brilliant guy and all that he had a huge ego but often his huge ego would kind of sabotage what he was working with and later in his career after he purchased um pixar and worked with the pixar management team and saw how good those guys were when they had you know creative problems and how they could work it out and he really changed his tune so when he came back to apple he was really a different guy and he'd learned from the Pixar guys how to sort of keep his ego in control. And, and he was a much better leader manager and Apple just kind of soared. But it took him 10 years away from the company that he founded, you know, <laughs> in order to learn yeah. that. He had to, he had to take that journey to change his thinking. Right. Yeah. Different influences. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. So now you've kind of, you've i mean it touches on creativity and it has to do with strategy and innovation but you've come up with an idea called stratovation and uh, could you explain that to me right so yeah this was quite a few years ago um i was the big thing like 15 years ago whatever it was if you read the harvard business review everything was kind of all about leadership and you know there's a lot of that going on now of course and then the next trend was was strategy and in fact, I saw a talk by Michael Porter in Halifax by a complete fluke, which was great. And of course, he turned me on to, you know, thinking hard about strategy. And then the next thing that came along was innovation, which we're still kind of talking about that an awful lot. But anyway, I sort of put these three things together, leadership, strategy and innovation, and realized that if, like in an organization, for example, these are the three things that move you forward, looking for the, looking at the long term. And so I started thinking, well, all these leaders out there, you know, what are the two main tools that they use to look at the future? And I decided it was strategy and innovation and how they're actually very similar. So I coined this term, which is not necessarily just mine, but use the term strategy and innovation, meaning how these things blend together. And here's a way in which they're very similar and how they blend together is that they're both really concerned with the future and nobody knows the future. You know, we, we're always predicting the future and we're often right, but we don't know when we're going to be wrong. So, you know, really nobody knows the future. You know, we're all think we're going to wake up one day, but, you know, tomorrow morning, but that's, there's going to be a morning where that's not going to happen or whatever. Mm -hmm. And yeah, everybody that goes to bed. Yeah. Everybody that dies went to bed thinking they'd get up tomorrow right. morning. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. So we don't know when we're going to be wrong. So the thing about looking out into the future, that's what strategy does. And that's what innovation does. Those mindsets, they look out into the future and you don't know, and you have to get comfortable with that. 
And so the, my other big insight with where they're linked is that they, they also uh, use symbols. Um, a general with a map, you know, it's a symbolic representation of the, of the battle terrain. And, and uh, you know, mathematicians who are using mathematical symbols and musicians that are using uh, musical symbols and and all these you know they both really rely on like an engineering diagram or something turns into a factory and a power diagram turns into a data center and you know a map tells the general where he thinks he's going to make his attack or not make his attack so they both really rely on symbols which are shorthand for kind of big complicated things and your brain can just look at a small number of symbols and you know do quite a lot so both strategy and innovation are about the future which you don't know and they both relied a lot on symbols. So I kind of have this uh, graph called the Stradivation graph and say over on one end, you know, you're really over here and you're way over on the Stradivation end and some other time you're really over here on the, uh, the strategy part, you know, one end and innovation on the other, but it's kind of like a, a needle that goes back and forth on this Stradivation graph. So I had that insight quite a long time ago and I think, you know, leaders in complicated situations are good at you know what I call stratification, and they're also good at you know the other stuff of organizing a company and keeping it going. But really, that's something for sort of the middle managers to do. The senior people have to be looking far out. And sometimes what you decide to do is you know we're just going to say the course it's working great. But other times it's like no, there's either a big opportunity or a bigger a big threat coming at us. And part of this stratification idea that I use actually really f focuses on the idea of an anomaly. Because usually we're doing business as usual and we're doing productivity and we're, you know, things are working okay. We want to incrementally make it better. That's kind of normal and we're all happy. But but suddenly an anomaly is going to come along. And if we if we like it, we're going to call it an opportunity. And if we don't like it, we're going to call it a threat. But the main thing is just different from the status quo. And so that's kind of, you know, Stradivation is like looking for these anomalies uh, wherever they might be. And oh, by the way, they're probably not going to be right in front of your nose which is another reason to be, you know, looking outside your lane. Sounds like a good little, like almost like a map or a guide through the creative principle, through the creative process. Yes, uh, for sure. And I, I, I started doing this sort of looking at organizations and, you know, from companies to armies and all that sort of stuff, you know, organizational behavior and in the, in the wide world. But then I realized that a lot of it does actually apply too to the creative process of like an individual or a small team a little team in the lab or a bunch of theater people working on a theater project. These same ideas about, you know, dealing with the big world and, you know, what are you going to bring to the big world and navigate through it also, you know, apply to the smaller scale projects. Because I guess like, you know, where you're up trying to identify an opportunity just in a creative industry or let's say it's film or theater or whatever, you're looking for a trend. That's the opportunity, right? Right. What's the exactly. issue? What, am I, what do I want to talk about? What are people going to respond to? Right. And here's something really interesting, because I do know some brilliant people. And the cool thing about them is you, you know, they're going to surprise you all the time. That, you know, that's what I really noticed. And so thinking about one person in particular, and what I noticed was um, a musician friend of mine, is that when everybody else was looking at the big picture and the general situation, he was examining the small scale something or other, you know, like, how does this work from close up? And then also the other way when everybody's like looking at some small issue in great detail and really analyzing it this guy sort of backs way off and looks at the bigger picture so an insight that i had is the idea if you're kind of feeling stuck to use that word is to change the scale and if you're you know if you're looking in the middle level of something look at the real fine detail and then step out and look at the big picture or if you're looking at the big picture all the time come back and just pick some of the small details and really analyze them and that by its very nature is gonna sort of make you look at the situation differently. And generally that's where the anomalies come from. They either come from something big hidden behind that mountain or something right under your foot that you're either gonna trip over or will help you with your project. Hmm. So the happy accident. Yes, for sure. That, yeah, I mean, this, here's a funny thing. Like our life is completely a series of friggin' accidents, right? And here's an ego thing is that we think if everything's going our way, you know, we're really in control and we're so brilliant and we're just doing a really great job. But really, we're kind of bumbling along. You know, everybody's bumbling along. 
and and that's you know that's nature that's part of being nature in, in living in nature but our egos you know want us to uh, to be way more in control than is actually uh, possible so would you say we're much more creative within constraints cuz you have a saying you've said to me all the time as you as you as I've asked for your advice on my creative projects which is art loves change right yeah art loves change by Nadia Boulanger, who was this fantastic pianist, composer, and piano teacher to the top composers, sort of through the 1900s and into the early, uh, into the early uh, t 20th uh, century, um, is, is that, yeah, and it, this is really, really ironic, that art loves change. So if you think about forms, like the sonata is a form, you know, or solving an engineering problem in a certain way. A lot of it is about form, and form is about rules and constraints, and that allows you to be creative. And so, you know, people think if they can just sort of hang around all the time and space out, they're going to have these brilliant ideas, which is partly true, but you have to work within constraints. And, and so the really creative people have, you know, as they've changed the world, world, they've sort of mastered a form really well, and then they've actually changed the form but they had to learn what it was first, and that was the constraint. Um, and he here's a story that I that I love about the sort of perseverance thing and the constraints. This guy, um, Stephen Pressfield, who wrote a he wrote Bagger Vance and a whole bunch of good things, and he has this quirky book called The War, um, The War of Art instead of The Art of War about the I've read that. It's a, you you actually recommended it to me. Yeah, it's a great book. It's a short little book. But, but part of it is about perseverance. And he has this great story about the Marines. And earlier in his life, he was a draft dodger, didn't want to go to Vietnam, I guess. And he said he ended up in the Marines. And what did he learn from the Marines? He learned how to be miserable. And the Marines don't pride themselves on being you know, the best fighting force and the you know, best killers and all that stuff, although, of course, that's part of the job. But he said they really pride themselves on being able to put up with pain and discomfort and, you know, drag their pack along that last mile, you know, marching through the wet forest and all that stuff. It's a point of pride to be able to put up with difficult situations. And I thought that's a great metaphor for our time where things really are mostly so easy. You know, push some buttons, you know, so the Internet will do this or that and complain if it's slow Internet and slouch over in your chair and complain about stuff versus the Marines. Um, I think about my cousin who was kind of a like a almost a Navy SEAL in the Norwegian Navy and just all the really tough things that they used to do. So, you know, you're always hearing about grit and resilience and that stuff. But I mean, we try to make everything easy and we've lost that ability to persevere, which is really important. And if you're going to work on a long creative project like a novel or a screenplay or some really difficult theorem that's going to take you months of work to do, you have to stick with it. So you almost have to relish being miserable the way these Marines are out in like the wet jungle. So I love that story. Like what, what I learned from the Marines was how to yeah. be miserable. They take pride in it. No, that's that's good. Because I, I remember watching a, a video of some Marines training and the instructor was saying something like, there's always one more thing you can do. There's always one more action right. you can take. And it speaks to something that we talked about earlier, which is like sometimes you're like two weeks away from that breakthrough. It's that persistence, that, 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 that dedication to suffering that you're talking about. Right, right. And, and an interesting thing, too, I want to come back to Robert Fritz with his very simple, brilliant theory of creativity. And the essence of it is that you're starting something and you kind of have a vague idea where you are and you want to go somewhere and you've got some idea in your mind about where you want to go. And so the whole creative process is about going in this direction. And he uses the term current reality. And when I took the seminar, at first, I thought it means, well, yeah, you've got to look around and be objective and all that. That's very important. That's the reality part. But after all, I realized, no, the key word is the word current, because reality, reality is always changing and that you're trying to go towards your final outcome, your sculpture or, you know, your engineering device or whatever it is. But you, you have to be really clear on where you are right now. And that's the current part. So your project's always changing, the world around you is changing, your tools that you have are changing, you know, are you going forward or not? So you have to be objective every single day. And maybe what you thought yesterday was, was real has changed overnight. Something is new in the world that you have to figure out. That's the current part. So it's pulling you towards your final outcome. And when you get to your final outcome, and I love this, 
all of a sudden it's not yours anymore. And I think this is part of the creative block idea because if you actually finish something, then it goes out to the world and you would analyze it and see how good is it, is it you know what you thought it would be, whatever, in this objective way, because you're no longer the creator, the creating part's already done. Everybody gets to look at it. And then you and then you just say, okay, well, how did it go? And then you learn stuff and then you move on to your next project. But you have to finish it in order to sort of step back and say, okay, how did it go? You know, when I started out, I wanted to get X. Now I've got the X, is it any good? You know, what did I learn? And all that sort of stuff. But you actually have to finish it. And I think, you know, when people talk about being stuck, partly it's like the ego doesn't want to finish something because, hey, it might not be so good. You know, it, it might not be as good as I thought. And creative people, so you have to do the perseverance part to get to the end, to step aside. And all of a sudden you're just like anybody else. You know, once a sculptor is sitting there in the plaza, anybody can walk around and have an opinion you can and somebody that doesn't know about sculpt about sculpture but it's like suddenly you're just like a, anybody else so what if you did it big deal it's done now buddy and you need to get the through the persistence and something else that robert to get to the end but something else that fritz says which is super uh important is that you're also just allowed to change your mind you know you've got this passion for your project and you get halfway done or two-thirds done or something and for some reason it's not that important to you anymore. So you're allowed to actually maybe stop completely forever or put it aside. And that's an interesting thing about creative people too. They will sometimes put something aside because they're bored, by the way. That's You're allowed to be bored with something, but then they'll come back to it perhaps much later. Now that they're bringing something in from a new direction, they'll go, oh my goodness, you know, I'm glad I learned all that. I'm glad I did all this stuff five years ago because now I've got something new to bring to the table but they had to sort of get bored and move, move away. So this persistence thing is a bit of a paradox. You know, persistence can move a, away. And if you look at all these talented people in history, they had all kinds of projects that they would put aside and that they would come back to perhaps, or maybe never come back to. And so I think, you know, it's an illusion to say that, that these brilliant people, you know, everything just sort of flowed. They had all kinds of things that worked, all kinds of things that didn't work. But some of the stuff that worked is because they went back and remembered what they did before, like Da Vinci and Claude Shannon and all these people, and they brought it in with a sort of a fresh, uh, a fresh look from what they're doing now. But Robert Fritz emphasizes, you know, you're allowed to change your mind, you're allowed to put something aside. So, you know, persistence up to a point. So letting go, because that can be a trap, right? Because sometimes you need to know when to quit. Right, exactly. Yeah, and there's no easy answers to this. And sometimes, you know, like your life or your profession or whatever it is, just forces you to go elsewhere. But that turns out to be good later, because then you realize, you know, oh, I'm in a new path and I'm glad I did something three years ago. I'm going to go back to that and blend it in. And you see that all over the history of science and art. Interesting. So, you know, it's, it's embracing failure as a part of the process too, right? Right, which as social beings, we don't like that part. We don't want our peers to not think we're cool. And by the way, one of my rants is that today we seem like we're obsessed with being cool, just to put it in those simple terms. You know, and, and actually we're such conformists and all these pretty pictures on the internet of all these cool people talking to their cool friends and all that stuff. That That's actually a real trap. And I think the really creative people you know, sort of get used to being shunned in a way because they're often, you know, going down their own path and maybe it's not going to go anywhere and maybe it's not popular. So I think, you know, part of a high level creative person is just getting used to uh, being criticized and being disrespected and, uh, and all that sort of stuff. Because uh, coming back to the ego, the ego just wants to be stroked every day and wants to be cool every day. Well, there's nothing creative about that. Sorry. So um, how do we find our creative process? And how do we know when we've well, found it? Yeah, well, well here's something, um, is the idea of a mentor. Really in the history you know, of people that we know about have been very creative, pretty much all of them were lucky to have at least one mentor in their early lives who gave them some encouragement. And um, maybe it's only one actually, or if you're lucky, it was a bunch in a sort of a sequence, but recognize that you have some talent and that you have initiative and they give you a bit of guidance. So there's been all kinds of brilliant people and creative people in history who frankly never had a chance, 
because you know they lived in poverty or whatever society they didn't have a freaking chance but generally people had you know had some mentors and so you know that gives you the encouragement to kind of keep going on your path and then you and often what so what happens is you have to kind of almost surpass your mentor so especially the more powerful the mentor is there's all these you know stories of you learn so much from this person but then you have to go off on your own path so there's a break with the mentor and then you know you go off but earlier on you had this encouragement and they taught you the you know essentials of the field and encourage you to learn on your own and all that sort of stuff so that's really really common and i think there's probably a lot of brilliant people who just never had that one you know key mentor and they sort of stayed in their garage their whole life and didn't go as far as they might have gone and it, it well, like if you take leonardo da vinci for example like this is really interesting he was the illegitimate child his father was a notary which is a real like low level lawyer so probably not the most brilliant guy in the world you know somebody that had some status and had this and had that but probably no genius and his mother was like a farm girl nobody really knows anything about the mother so the brilliant parent was probably the mother some farm girl who, who helped create this leonardo da vinci guy and, and here's another similar story is nikola tesla and his father i forget exactly what he did but he was very successful but he was just kind of a mid-level you know guy and he was very very strict and not that interesting and um but the mother tesla's mother was known as this lady who could fix anything and kind of build anything at a time when women had you know pretty much no status beyond the home and yet she was very well known as a lady who could fix anything and build anything well where did tesla get his weird talents probably not his father his mother so right. you know and the parent as the mentor kind of thing interesting so it's really somebody to uh, i guess give you that foundation and set you on the right path so then you can go find right. your own right and like if, if you look at einstein who was a pretty quirky character who didn't start to speak till he was quite a bit older and and all that sort of stuff and he he hated school in in germany and switzerland because it was very rigid and very regimented and he hated that and you know he didn't do very well at a lot of things because he didn't want to do very well and he didn't you know want to impress the teacher sort of thing and he was extremely rebellious but then later in life he did have some really great teachers which allowed his you know his sort of talent to flourish but uh he and you know he so, so just a sort of strange thing about these people too is the balance between having some structure and being formally taught and then going the other way as well so when einstein got his doctoral degree he applied for all these positions in universities and he didn't get any because he wasn't anywhere near the top of his class so he ended up with the job as a patent clerk which is basically a half-time job and but it was also good because he had to conceptualize all these uh, patent applications mechanically to see if they would might work or they might not work and he had from his father's um business he'd been doing that also but if he would have had a real high-powered competitive job in a university right off the bat he wouldn't have had this basically half time to work on his own stuff so again you know he had a lot of training and a lot of mentors up to a point but then he needed a lot of time by himself which was the other side of the things. And if he would have gotten a hotshot university job right out of PhD land, he wouldn't have had that, you know, time to think. He wouldn't have had the time and space to explore. To explore time and space. Yeah, That's to right. explore time and space, exactly. Yeah. I made a joke, I didn't even know it. I can't help myself sometimes, David. So we are coming to the end of our time. Um, but I mean, is there any like final thoughts you can leave us on like, finding or defining your creativity process or some big ideas so the that. first thing is okay yeah so you really have to love what you do you know that's really it and so if you like look at kids like oscar upstairs playing with his trucks and putting things together and taking them apart i mean he's a little engineer he loves that and i i know once i gave him a bunch of colored pencils to do some drawings and he took all his colored pencils and he lined them up by color and I made the comment, he's probably going to be an engineer, not an artist. And somebody said, well, you know, don't say that. You know, don't hold your kid back. But, but really, you have to love what you do. So that, that's the most important thing, because there will be a lot of drudgery 
and you know if you're really creative you're going to get a lot of negative feedback so you've got to love it so you know i'm working on a couple of books now i've kind of been a writer my whole life and i you know understand the drudgery of writing but i've always loved books and i love to read and i've loved to write and i did a lot of drawing and stuff when i was younger but you but you've got to love it and and some people have a huge amount of talent in a field so they go down that road like say they're really good at math in school and they end up as an accountant or whatever they do but later they realize that just because it's easy for them you know they don't particularly love it so you know being good at something could be a trap and often the most creative people aren't necessarily the ones with the sort of the most raw talent but they love their field and they're explorers so if you don't love something you know you're not going to put up with the drudgery that's part of it. And then the other part is just figuring out a system that works for you, which, you know, everybody's different and some people figure it out while they're young. Um, but, you know, kind of going back to the child prodigies, most prodigies don't really make a big impact in their field. So, you know, a bit of a struggle early on, but just loving it to keep going is, is big. And there's a, I think there's a paradox now because it's kind of the time when it's never been easier to do anything really. But that sort of ease that we have, we're very impatient and we don't stick with stuff and we just sort of flip from one thing to another thing. And that's really superficial and not creative. So you gotta be partly like the Marine and like love the drudgery. And, and part of that, just to add, is that you can't tell when the breakthroughs are gonna come. So, you know, if you can't put up with the drudgery, you'll be, you know, you'll just be out of the game maybe the day before your breakthrough. Right. So that's all very kind of prosaic and not fancy <laughs> advice. Right. So, yeah. so do what you love because you're going to have to be persistent. And mm -hmm. uh, don't worry because the creative process is going to be messy and you're probably going to be all over the rails, but you're in yes. it and you may not recognize it. Thank you so much for talking to us today, David. Uh, it's been a really interesting insight into the creative process. And I'm hoping we can talk again sometime. Absolutely, Mike. Well, you're one of those creative guys, and just this project that you're doing is a creative project. All right. Well, thanks for talking to us today. Okay, Mike. Thank you. And that's today's episode of In Process. Uh, have an idea for a show, an interesting speaker that uh, might lend some insight into the mystery that can be the creative process. Drop us a line. You can reach us at uh, in process at movingmagazine.ca. And uh, we'd look forward to uh, exploring any ideas you might have on this creative journey.